Let's get corrupted. What's up, YouTube? It's your boy Joe with Meteoric Serpents coming back at you for another episode of the Colubrid Corruption Podcast. Guys, first and foremost, happy Easter to all those who celebrate. Thank you for anyone who's tuning in right now. Uh, I hope you all had a fantastic day with your families. Uh, our day pretty much just ended. Obviously, we're on the East Coast, so kind of winding down on the night for us over here. Um, yeah, guys, you know, I wanted to add a couple things to the intro. A couple of things I've been like forgetting to mention. Uh, also, just wanted to talk about, you know, what's going on with myself because I figured I might as well give you guys some kind of background of what's going on here. Uh, first and foremost, you know, before I even get started, cool to tell you tonight is episode number 20 of the Colubra corruption podcast and we have on chris from copperhead reptilia very excited to have him on uh he's been a good presence on social media i think he has some uh interesting things i see some of the stuff he posts i'm like that's cool i don't know where he's coming from with that with some of the things he talks about with social media but uh so i'm really interested to talk to him about that and i think it's going to be a fun conversation um, so yeah, guys, typical stuff. Uh, well, actually, so I had my first Kaluber cl clutch of the season. Uh, got a good Texas rat clutch, six good eggs, super excited about it. I have another female that should be laying soon. Um, so super stoked about that. And, you know, just got to keep the season rolling. Probably some ball pythons getting closer and closer on the way. Um, and we'll see what else. Maybe there's some uh, surprises that'll come later this season. Guys, as usual, I do have Meteoric Serpents t-shirts available. Uh, feel free to hit me up. I have them in pretty much all sizes. I'd be happy to arrange that and get one over to you. Um, all my social medias are down below here. You can see me on Instagram. That's probably where I post everything. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe on today's podcast. Guys, if you've been enjoying this, obviously I've been enjoying this. Um, we're on episode number 20. And guys, I'm very, very sorry for the gap last week. I will strive to not let that happen. Unfortunately, I had a couple people cancel on me. It's all good with them. And then I was traveling. So um, kind of just an is what it is, you know, life happens. So it's all good. Uh, we are back and we are keeping this rolling. Um, morph market. I do have some animals still available on morph market. So if you're interested, go check those out and see what's up. All those links are down in the description. Uh, you know, another thing that I, I don't know why I haven't been mentioning it guys, make sure you're supporting us arc, uh, us arc, Membership is extremely important. If you're in this reptile hobby, one bit, you should be a US ARC member. Um, the, the US ARC and US ARC Florida, by the way, the cheapest memberships for both of those, in my opinion, and I know this could come off as harsh, if you could afford to feed your animals month over month, you could afford a yearly US ARC membership, the cheapest one. And that's it, just the cheapest one. Just be a member, be supporting. Um, you know, US Arc is the group that fights against uh, whether it's statewide or national wide legislation that prevents us from keeping reptiles in each and every respective state. So, uh, yeah, we should 100% be supporting that if we like keeping our reptiles. So, yeah. Uh, next thing I always talk about him. Uh, Blake's Exotic Feeders. If you're looking to diversify the diet for your reptiles, I fully endorse this product. Hand-raised quail down here in South Florida. I go and I'm able to pick up my quail by hand from Blake. Send him a DM. Again, that's Blake's Exotic Feeders on Instagram. Uh, if you're interested, I could send you the price list even. Um, and make sure you send him that DM because if you go straight to his website, it's going to charge an auto shipping price and that shipping price is going to be expensive. So, to get around that shipping price, send him a DM. I know he just posted today that he was actually doing specifically 15% off shipping. Uh, he was shipping out Tuesday. So if you're interested, go check that out. Uh, next couple things. Sorry, guys, this is long, but I, you know, I kind of like this. I like talking to you all. So hope you're all doing well. I uh, started a new thing on the podcasting front that is not having to do with my you know, purely myself and my channel. Um, 
it's really awesome. But MJ from the Trap Talk Reptile Network had invited me to be a part of his network and do a segment on the channel. And I'm doing that with Alvaro from Clover's Reptiles. I had him on my show. Uh, this segment on his network is called Thank God It's Colubrids. And we're doing it every Friday um, at 9 p.m. EST. So that was really fun for the first episode. You know, I, again, guys, just talking to a new group of people, me and Alvaro, we vibe very well because we're friends in real life. So it's pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, yeah. So that's cool. Go check that out. If you're interested in watching the first episode, we had a good time that night. And last but not least, the first link in the description of the video today uh has the link to the meteoric serpents patreon couple things with that one there's cool perks about it cool perks there uh i really want to build community in this hobby i think the colubra community kind of lacks in you know coming together as as one uh you know it's kind of just small scattered things so i i really want to try and build that community myself and three you're you're really just supporting me you're helping me make this podcast better and that's what i want to do i want i want to take this bigger and better uh and do a whole lot of things with it and i think i could do that with your guys's support um you know as well as me keeping this going you know you guys tuning in every week pushes me to keep this going and keep making it bigger and better so hope i am doing that for you guys Let's see who is in the chat tonight, guys. Uh, we got Eric's More Factory. What's up, man? I heard you had a great show at uh, Sarasota today. Uh, well, you told us you had a great show. So um, that's awesome, man. Props. Chris from BNS Reptilia. What is up, man? Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, Dustin SMK, thanks for being here. Brock, what is up, dog? talk about my favorite colubrids he wants to talk about kribos uh solid serpents looking at guess ig the twin spotted rat snake is cool don't know anything about those yeah let's talk about it guys all right guys without further ado let's bring him out uh no more time being wasted welcome chris from copperhead reptilia what's up man how are you no doing well how are you doing i'm doing well yeah man uh we've been following each other on instagram for a little bit, or maybe since I started the podcast, I don't really know, but um, yeah, I think around then, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have a pretty diverse collection. I was telling you beforehand, like I was almost just at a loss of what kind of questions to ask you, just because there's so many animals across so many different species, and I'm just like, there's one here, one there, a little bit of everything. Um, and all your <laughs> setups are like pretty cool, so uh, I'm just really interested to talk to you about it. Yeah, totally. I appreciate that a lot. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so if you don't mind, can you kind of give your background, however long or short you want, kind of give your background about reptiles and how you got into the hobby and all that? Yeah, totally. Um, I feel like I've got that pretty normal origin story, you know, grew up catching garter snakes. I had the like, I actually had the garter snake that actually did kind of well after we caught her and like had her... I think a year or two before she passed, but anyway, had her did, you know, hermit crabs, fish, that kind of deal. Um, when I was 10, um, my parents got me a 14 year old ball python that was not supposed to live as long as he is because he's still with me. He'll be 31 next month. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I've had him 17 years and it just kind of snowballed from there. It was, I got him a few years later, I got a corn snake. Um, I want to say probably after a, about four to five years got into the new caledonian geckos okay um mandarin rat snakes things like that so just always was you know the big steve Irwin, jeff corwin kind of kid always yeah. read the reptile books you know that was just always my thing um for a while i was working in you know animal shelter work and i was actually like the one of the like exotic animal people there um i still work heavily with um the one of the like only two reptile rescues left in my state so okay. that's just kind of that's the keeping it short and sweet without going too in depth into anything yeah sure awesome um and then yeah so yeah talk about that a little bit though the reptile rescue so you, you work 
at one of those or you volunteer? Yeah. Um, it's, it's at a weird phase right now where I started out kind of like volunteering. I was someone okay. where I kind of would, if like really weird things came in or if they had like a snake, that was a species I was interested in. That was like, had a particularly bad attitude. Um, like if you ever see the boa that I post in the really big, like enclosure with all like the logs and the plants and all that, um, she was a little bit too aggressive to place with a normal adopter. So like she came to me, um, got it. So I started doing that. I've been working with them about, I want to say going on three years now. And it's at a point where like I run their social media. Um, when we do like outreach events, I do those. Um, I help, or I do a lot of the photography for our website, uh, things like that. So I am gotcha. pretty in depth with that as well. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now I am very curious cause like you, you mentioned, so like even the, um, the variance in the collection between different species started like mm -hmm. when it, when the collection first started. So what has inspired you? Cause I feel like you have it, yours isn't even like a Noah's Ark kind of thing. Like, I feel like I, I see one and one of a few different things. And then you have a few of, of other species and, and whatnot. So, what is it for you? Are you kind of more like a, I, I would say you're kind of more of a collector, right? On the collector side, like you just want the, the cool stuff that you like. So to quote, I, I know you had him on here, um, Zach Loafman. I've got a little yeah. bit of that herpetocultural ADHD okay. where like I have had between 60 and 80 species in the time I've been keeping. Nice. Um, so I work, but the thing is with what I do, I primarily have like small groups. So I have like North or I have King snakes, North American rat snakes, old world rats, Morelia, locality boas. And then I just have like the odds and ends where like, I have a lot of different things, but when you break it down, they kind of all fall into certain categories, which like, I don't tend to do a lot of old world boas because I just haven't done well with those. So like I do have like sand boas and dumerals and candoya, but also those are like a very extreme minority because I do better with like the like South American boas. So gotcha, mm -hmm. gotcha, yeah, very cool. Um, you know, diving into your collection a little bit, and mm -hmm. I'm I'm interested about these guys. Uh, because it like even in your bio, you keep the and forgive me if I mispronounce this. Is it the Slowinski eye? Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, Pantherophis emrei slowinskii. So they yeah. have a lot of names. They have a lot of history in the hobby, and a lot of it is kind of like controversial, so to speak. Okay. Um, so the Slowinski's rat snake was known in the 1900s as a Kisachi corn. They were thought for years to be a um, a subspecies or like a locale of corn snake. So they were treated as such. And for a long time, they were actually crossed into some lines of corn snake in the hobby. Right. Then um, I want to say in the 70s to 90s, they started believing it was a naturally occurring intergrade of the corn and the Great Plains rat, which is emery eye. Um, right. So they were just treated as kind of like a natural hybrid. And then I want to say 2002, whenever the Burbank paper came out, he decided that they were best suited as a subspecies of emery eye and they are kind of like a really weird um like they're found on the texas louisiana border and they call them kisatchis because they are found primarily in the kisatchi forest of louisiana they're a very dark colored they look like a corn snake but they are like chocolate brown um yeah. i actually have one right here if you want to see it real yeah, quick yeah go for it pull it out so where are you up on the on the screen so she's a little twitchy oh sorry but so like you can see here it looks just like a corn snake but they're this very dark two-tone brown um this is one of my younger females and she is not quite as tame as they usually are they normally have a much more mellow temperament than a lot of the north american rats okay but um i figured those might come up so i grabbed one but um yeah yeah but so for a long time, they were treated as a weird, muddy corn snake, and not a lot of people actually work with them anymore. 
Um, there's two distinct bloodlines, but they all have very, very small uh, founder groups. So like Chris Montross, the one I held up is actually from his bloodline, which is the Natchitoches okay. bloodline. And then there's one other line that is from Texas. Um, so last year I was able to acquire a new wild caught individual that I want to work into the line. Um, nice. He's a little bit more unique because he's still got that dark chocolatey brown, but the spots on his sides are actually like yellow and orange. So we're not entirely sure if he's like some percentage corn snake crossed in, if it's just a weird intergrade because he is actually right. from the Kaskatchee Fork. Okay. Um, I was going to say, it must be a little tough because, like, they do automatically have that corn snake look, but then also have mm -hmm. the dark tones like MREI. So I, I'm sure even just trying to pick out, like, it's the same thing with even, like, well, I don't want to say it's the same thing, but, like, even, um, you know, when you look at hatchling, any, any of the obsolete group, it's just like you're looking mm -hmm. at a gray, blotchy snake, and it's like, what the hell are you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> yeah and these guys are really interesting because like they start out very very dark and then they kind of lighten up but it's interesting because like the different i mean it's n it's not surprising but the different locales have different colors like the louisiana line tends to be like the really rich chocolate and mahogany where the texas line tends to be more like grays and pinks almost okay and the texas line is where there are two morphs of slowinski so there's a they call it black to differentiate it from anery. Um, but so there's an anery morph, which looks just like an anery corn, except you know how anery corns get like the yellow flush to them, like yeah. along their neck and their belly. They yeah. don't get that. Um, but there's only one person producing those. And he produced two of them last year. And he's not even sure if they are the morph because they don't show it till later on in life. Gotcha. Um, and then there's the silver leaf, which looks just like a shatter corn. So there's always been a rumor that that lineage may have been crossed to a corn at one point to put some morphs in, but no okay. one's really for sure yet. You know, I've seen the name silver leaf thrown around mm -hmm. somewhere with corn. So I definitely didn't know that. Um, you know, it's, it's yep. interesting because I, I have heard uh, just over the years. And I really didn't know this for a very long time about the different corn snake morphs and how some other mm -hmm. things have kind of been thrown in there to become, uh, corn snake. And I don't know, speaking of that, uh, <laughs> whether or not they want me to say this, it's whatever. I sent some <laughs> sheds off to Dr. Booth, uh, for Eric Westmoreland to find yep. out if, uh, scaleless corns are really texas hybrids or not or i'm sure someone else was sending some other species sheds as well but um you did? i am yep yeah. i have um i'm sending off a bunch of emery eye sheds because i have thorn scrub and go. i have the slowinski so i'm sending them off okay. but i wrote a letter to dr booth saying like there's about four of these that might pop up with corn snake in them and if they do please wow. let me know because inquiring minds would like to know yeah okay interesting I I mean, listen, all mine look all my animals look Texas. I've never I've never been convinced of the animals that I've bred here have been anything but Texas rats. But I am mm -hmm. very curious to hear the corn snake results because I'm sending what yeah. I what I believe to be pure Texas sheds. So I'm curious to find out if they find something in there. I don't know. Yeah, like there's always been a little bit of debate. I'm not sure if you knew have heard of this or not, but the um are you familiar with the Tessera morph of corn snake? Yes. The, yes. So Tessera is a dominant trait that supposedly just kind of popped up randomly, but dominant traits usually don't just randomly occur like that. I mean they can, but you know. Okay. Um, but so there's this long standing rumor that Tessera was a cross of the Newport, California king snake being crossed to a corn snake where Newport, they call it Newport stripe. It's a dominant striped gene and the Tessera morph of corn snake has a reputation for they bite each other's necks and like hold on during breeding, which not a lot of other corn snakes do. And there's this whole like, if you cross a king to a corn for like two generations, it looks just like a corn. And oddly enough, the two men who worked together to establish tessera 
are the two people who also created created the silver leaf corn or the silver leaf uh slowinski i'm sorry and so there's always like this talk that like some of them might be like hybrids 10 generations back and so when i sent off sheds to dr booth i said the same thing i was like a few of these might pop with something and please let me know if they do i'd like okay. to settle that rumor so yeah, that's that's super interesting. I've definitely never heard that. Um, you know, I always talk about my old pet store experience. I never had really much hands on with Tessera. Uh, mm -hmm. The pattern morph I saw more was Mo Motley's recessive, right? Correct. On yep. Corns? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. We used to always breed it like it was a uh, het to het palooza and we would hit like mm -hmm. all different combos. But Motley was the pattern morph we were we were popping on there but uh yeah that's besides yeah. the point all right cool uh so yeah that's that's interesting because i really haven't heard of the i i feel like i learn something new every week this slowinski i just like kind of just brushed past me and it's you know obviously with the way things are named nowadays with mm -hmm. taxonomic changes it's kind of confusing to keep up with everything yeah, it's really interesting because, like, if you talk to, like, Dr. Loafman, for example, like, he'll call yeah. them Slowinski's rats. And, like, I call them that. But if I'm talking to, like, an older school herper and they don't know what a Slowinski is, but I say, oh, it's a Kisachi corn, they're, ob they're instantly like, oh, I know what that is. So it's, what, is, what does Montrose call them? Um, I honestly just, he and I have referred to them as, like, Slowinski I. Okay. So. I've talked to him a few times. So like the one I held up, like I said, that one's from him yeah. via Dr. Loafman. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. All right. Awesome. Um, Let's kind of break down the different groups. Cause I, I always go with like colubrid oriented with your collection first, and then we can talk about some of the other things. Uh, yeah, for sure. I guess we could break them into groups. I know you definitely have some other North American stuff. If you want to talk about and break down, just in general, again, I know you have quite a few species. So if you kind of want to talk about what's going on with your North American collection, go for it. Yeah. So um, the North American is the group that, honestly, the only big breeding projects out of that group are the Slowinski because I have okay. 11 of them. Okay. And as of right now, I'm the only person in the country who works with both the Louisiana and the Texas lineages. Everyone either works with one or the other. So I'm going to try and hopefully in the next year or two, start a project to cross them, see what comes out and also put the new wild caught line that I have in. Um, I do have some corn snakes. Um, that was the first snake I bred like 90% of people. Um, but um, the only gene I really work with in corn and I'm still growing them out to breed is the palmetto because I was okay. I was a kid when the first Palmetto was in Reptiles magazine and I just thought they yeah. were cool. And I, I know the gene has some issues and I'm prepped to deal with that, but I don't want to create a ton of them. It's more of just a fun, like side burner. Right. Um, other than that, I don't really have too much slated to breed for North Americans. Um, I'm, I have, um, like I said, the corns, uh, as far as Kings, I have, you know, Florida, Brooks, Prairie, California and um, I have a gray band and a one of the fairy, so the variable kings. Okay. Yeah. So that's the king group. And what I kind of do is I will usually buy like one animal. And then as it raises up, if I'm like, wow, I really like this particular animal, I then start that more like casual search for like uh, a pair for them because okay. there's a lot of species I really enjoy but not enough to make either a like a full-time project out of it like i love yeah. the prairie king snakes like those are the most mellow king i have ever worked with apart from the gray band but they're brown and they're small right. and no one really cares about them so it there would be no reason for me to have 10 of them it's something where that's how a lot of my stuff is where i just have like a pair um so like i have those as far as the rat snakes i have um obviously the slowinskis i have yellow black gray um I think i'm drawing a blank um trans pecos and i know you're, there's you're another one i'm forgetting. Texas. oh i have two you texas 
Oh, you do? Okay, okay. I was going to yep. say, you need some Texas in your life. No, I have a, um, I have a wild type, and then I have a, um, one of the mineral wells lines uh, nice. bells, and I picked that up at the October Tinley. So that was something I cool. kind of always wanted, but yeah. And then nice. um, I have my dirty little secret, which is um, I have an MBK corn hybrid, which is just a ridiculous looking animal. Interesting. I saw her on Morph Market for a hundred bucks and I was like, that's the weirdest looking thing I've ever seen. She looks like one of those Mexican um, night snakes, like the Mexican rat snakes. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And she's super weird. And I forgot. I also have an MBK. So I, you know, I liked seeing the weird cross of the two. Um, Then I have a Depe Jani. So I have the North Mexican pines and I do a a bull. Um, I used to do Nerodia. I got out of them. Nerodian garter snakes are do not fit my program. So okay. those have since moved on. Um, trying to think if I'm missing anything North American in there. I think that's about the bulk of it, though. Okay. Got it. Now, um, what are, like, out of those, so you mentioned, like, how you'll sometimes group things up. Now, out of those, which ones are you kind of looking towards when it comes to breeding besides the ones you already mentioned if there's anything i'm going to pair up out of that group um the the variable king that i picked up at the october tinley is a a really really nicely patterned animal um really high yellow nice high orange um he's from a little bit of like an old school keepers line so um i've debated with him the thing is they're just they're so small as babies and i really don't know if i want to deal with a clutch of snakes that tiny um right again i really like the um the prairie king snakes they're but they're little brown dirt snakes that no one really cares about i don't really know that many people breeding them i just saw them at an expo for 60 bucks as a fresh hatchling and picked them up okay um and then the only other one that i i forgot to mention um so i picked her up from uh chris montross i do have a western fox so she's super fun but in michigan up on my end we have easterns which are endangered and are very very heavily monitored in the pet trade so i as much as i would like to breed her i don't feel super comfortable doing that because i don't want there to be a mistake or anyone mistaking westerns for easterns and then having dnr banging on my door so yeah no one have to kind of avoid that that. yeah yeah for sure because uh even if you got everything all squared away you that's like the last call you want even even me here like i'm not i'm definitely not keeping anything illegal but do i really want fwc knocking on my door not really no uh (laughs) but yeah okay cool so yeah, pretty pretty diverse on the North American stuff already. And then I, I know you have more than that. So let's switch. Before we go South American, let's go to the Old World stuff. Because I know you have some a few few Asian rat snakes uh, in the collection. I saw some bamboos. I saw some mandarins. Probably some yep. other stuff I'm missing. Yep. So with the Old World stuff, um, I currently... The only ones I'm looking at breeding are the twin spotted. So that's the bimaculata. Um, So those are European. Um, So I have those. And then I have um, the two mandarins that I have. So those are the only two I'm currently planning to breed. Um, I do have the bamboo. I have the coxi. Yeah. So I've... I'm I want to pair him up. I just haven't found a nice enough female in a range that I really want to spend because they they have an attitude. They don't always sell super well. Um, Yeah. So I'm kind of like just waiting for the right one to pop up. But I have the mandarins. Um, I have a Russian. I have two Japanese, which I also I've had the female for a year or two. But the male I just picked up from Eric Westmoreland at uh, Tinley a couple weeks back. One of Um, the albino ones he had yep i got i got the only male albino that he produced this year (laughs) so yep so i have that um i have a chinese king rat um and then i have um ridley eye so the uh cave racer the the gold with the blue head so i've been uh i've definitely been taking a liking to the 
like the beauty snakes, like the the cave mm-hmm. racers and stuff. Like, like some of them are really nice looking. And like I've loved blue beauties. That's one of the species that like, you know, I always talk about it when I started falling in love with Asian rat snakes, like blue beauties were on that list for me. But I was just always like, man, they're big, mm-hmm. they're aggressive, like this and that. But um, I know like the cave dwellers are, are a little bit more manageable size wise and they kind of just hide all day. Like, right. They just, they literally, as the, as their name implies, kind of just. Yep. Uh, mine is super nocturnal. Um, yeah. I, I literally will only see him out from about six to seven thirty PM on. Um, okay. he's got like a ledge he likes to go up to and he waits on in his enclosure and then he just waits for me to feed him. But yeah, the, Ridley, I do still have that beauty snake temperament. I don't think there's ever going to be getting fully okay. away from that. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, super fun. Um, they're really fun. They, they'll eat anything that moves. I mean, they're good feeders. Generally, they're, again, a little bit high strung. But the Ridley, I do stay on that little bit like five to seven foot. Most of them I see end up in the five to six range. I haven't really seen any big ones, but I want to say there's like two to three localities popping around. There's like the lowlands, which are more of like the grayish kind of washed out color. And then there's the Cameron highlands, which are the, the gold with the blue head, which is what I have. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I know I've been seeing, um, the different localities and some of those adults, man, are crazy. I I think Mm -hmm. it's the one you're talking about. Um, that's the Cameron highlands with the, the like yellow and the orange. Yes. The very bright bodies. Mm-hmm. okay yeah those those are amazing man so i can't wait to see that uh is it full size no he's about a year and a half old and i want to oh, say okay. he's a he's pushing three feet because i'm i'm one of those people where like i still feed my colubrids like on seven to nine day intervals yeah depending on like how much they're eating at a time but i don't slam food and i being this far north um i live kind of rural it's i live in an older house so my house naturally has a temp drop over winter so most of my stuff does get a pretty decent fasting period over winter each year so a lot of my stuff does grow slightly slower than some other people's collections do but at the same time i kind of prefer giving them that time to just kind of rest each winter gotcha gotcha while we're on the topic of feeding and stuff what's your like mentality on food size uh for some of these animals because i was talking about it the other day um you know, when it comes to especially like my hatchlings i always mm-hmm. i don't want to say like I, I power feed with the size but i definitely like push the needle with the size like i'm good at giving them an eye test of like what they can genuinely handle um mm-hmm. and i feel like some like even I've received animals this year that I'm like for this age, like, I feel like you should be a little bit beefier. Like, so I don't know. I, uh, I feel like some people are a little lax on feeding. How are you when it comes to size of meals and things like that? And I totally get what you're saying with the fasting. And I agree. Cause you know, we, we do the brumation and, and that's all a natural part of it, but just in general, like even grow ups and stuff. For me, it it's all dependent on the age of the animal, the activity level I'm seeing. Like, for example, the um, the variable king I have, that snake I feed every five days, okay. you know, and I got him in October and I think he's grown maybe an inch and a half, two inches. And I'm giving him a pinky, which stretches him to the max every five days. And so, you know, for him, it's like I, I would never push him more than that. I think there was right. one time I had two small pinkies, but like. For most of my snakes, I kind of like to see, I like to see them poop before I feed them again. Gotcha. Especially with like boas and pythons. Like I, I tend to be, I listened to your, uh, your episode on trap talk the other day. So great episode, by the way. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I was actually listening to that this morning, but, um, the, what I like to do, especially with like boas and pythons, they are one of those animals I feel like is going to take one big meal less frequently but i feel like colubrids generally are one of those things where they want to eat slightly smaller meals a little bit more frequently so i tend to especially while they're growing i'm really big on the like the first year to two years of life i'm giving most of them a meal every seven to ten days roughly um and i like to see like if i fed them on friday and by the next friday they haven't pooped yet i tend to kind of wait for them to poop 
and then I'll feed them immediately after that. So I'm yeah. kind of constantly always feeding something. Um, but as they get older, that's when I get to more of that, like, okay, 10 days, like do a chick or a mouse or a rat or whatever it might be. Right. Um, so I kind of do it species dependent and then judging on their activity level. Like I do have a Kribo and a false water Cobra. And I, those guys are like, usually if, I'm not doing two smaller meals a week. I'm doing one very large meal with like multiple prey items of different protein okay. types as well. So gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I find that. So I, in general, I'm feeding once a week on just about everything. Like I feed my pythons on, I, I've basically split it up. I feed my pythons on one day. Cause I get my, feeder rats on one Mm -hmm. day and then i'll usually feed my colubrids separate just because everything for them i get frozen thawed uh it's Mm -hmm. either mice or quail at this point so i do the for i i it's a good split because it just makes it so much easier so i do all the frozen thawed stuff and whatever um but yeah i i definitely agree it it's kind of a little bit on a species to species basis i'm definitely Mm -hmm. seeing fast metabolic uh processes on quail for sure mm-hmm. they're pooping so fat literally two days it's like i see the same with chicks yeah yeah mm-hmm. two days and then another two days later they're going again and i'm just like jesus and i'm cleaning mm-hmm. all the time um even on the rodents sometimes because i like i'm feeding the babies still um a rodent diet, but they, they go relatively fast, definitely within like five days, I'd say I'm mm-hmm. spot cleaning. So excuse me. I know all is well on, on that front as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was going to say, I have like with the, um, like not only just prey frequency, but prey type, like my pitch office. Um, so like my bull snake, he'll eat chicks and he will absolutely hammer them. But Again, kind of like you said, if I feed him a chick, it after two days later, he's pooped and he's absolutely ravenous. So I would rather like for him do like multiple mice or like multiple rat right. pups or something. And like even okay. with the Depe Jani, like she's the same way. So yeah. Yeah. I've also started to learn like kind of like so the Texas rats are just absolute savages. And also they have big heads, like their mm-hmm. heads expand very wide. Like they're able to take big meals uh in comparison to a lot of other species whereas you know now that i'm keeping some of the asian stuff is like they have narrower sorry they Mm -hmm. have narrower heads than uh the texas rats do so i'm like okay like we don't want to push meal size on these guys too much it's like keep it small for a lot longer um Mm -hmm. because they just can't take it. And there's more slender animals in general, whereas the Texas rats are a bit beefier in general, plus the the wider head. Yeah. And I've noticed the same thing. Like I have, again, I have a lot of the lamp propeltis. So like the yep. Kings and I left out that I have milk snakes as well, because I forget okay. about them. I, only, I have like a sign alone and I have an Eastern, but, okay. um, but like with the lamp propeltis, they have such a, with like the pantherophis, you see like they have the head and that kind of tapers to the neck and then yep. but when you feed them they just they stretch yes. lamp propeltis don't seem to have that and i feel like it's because they stretch vertically they do they like open the mouth but it's i think it's because they you know they're eating a lot of skinks and lizards or like yes. their nest raiders so they're going in there eating five yeah, pinkies snakes. and yep Exactly. So they don't have that need to really stretch where like pantherophis, you're going to find them. They're more of like a generalist. They're not going to really eat like other snakes, but you know, they'll go for lizards and frogs and rodents and birds. And, you know, so I feel like that and, you know, one of the old world species I have the, uh, I have an African file snake. Okay. And those guys, they're kind of like a king snake. Like they, they're very narrow. So like even at, I think two and a half years old, he's still on fuzzies because he's just such a slim stretched out snake that you have to feed them like three fuzzies instead of like right. one larger mouth. So I'm just right. waiting for him to get bigger, but you know? Yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. All right. 
awesome. And then now uh, you kind of implied it already. You have some South American stuff, and I know that's where it mm -hmm. gets uh, definitely one large animals to fun with the the rear fang stuff because <laughs> i know you have a false water cobra i know you got the baron so let's let's talk about uh south american stuff and then we can talk about whatever else i missed because i probably did on colubrid <laughs> side at least yeah um as far as the south american i have the um like you said the i have the unicolor Kribo and a false water cobra um both about six foot at this point um and then I have the Baron's Racer. I want to say those are, I'm running over in my head and just thinking of everyone. I yeah. want to say that's all I have for the South American, like, colubrid portion, because there's okay. not a ton of South American colubrids that I want to deal with, because I just, I don't do lizard feeders. Gotcha. It makes sense. That's, that's where I draw my line, but... Um, yeah, it's, it's tough, man, and I, I totally get you, and, like, that's a big factor on on species for sure is like the toughness of, <laughs> of feeding. Like I'm, I'm blessed to have all, you know, readily eating rodent feeders and I'll, I'll be completely honest. So I, you know, I've talked about my rhino rats and the adult one I got is doing great, but the baby has, I, I've been having trouble getting it to eat. I got it to eat its first meal here and it has not <laughs> eaten since. And I'm just like, it's killing have me. Have you tried dropping a pinky in the water dish? Yeah. Yes, Ugh. I've tried a bunch of things. Uh, someone made a suggestion to me with like uh, using the the Dawn dish soap method. That's what Matt Most does, mm -hmm. and I'm just like, all right, uh, back to the drawing board. I might even go back to minnows and and seeing what's up and see if it'll take it. But uh, it, yeah, yeah, so I got it to take off tongs its first meal, and then now it just won't take, and I'm pissed. I hate that. My that's why like i you would think i would have a rhino at this point in my life and i i think they're cool but i am team barons all the way because i can just okay. open up the viv and she just flies forward grabs it and she's yeah. gone with it you know listen i'll tell you what the adult one i got well it's like a sub adult but she's a, a 21 female uh, i started feeding mm -hmm. her quail asap like no hesitation she comes up grabs right away like done yeah uh so very happy to have a very established uh, you know, decent started animal. Um, you know, I got to take the challenge with the baby. I'm up for the challenge because definitely something to learn if I'm going to want to breed them in the future. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, there's like a couple of species that I've had that are just like, they're slow starters or whatever. And like, sometimes it's just finding that, like that just what it takes to like crack right with them you know what i mean it's yeah. it's like once you get there you're like okay cool i know what you want i can provide that it's just you need to tell me what you want yeah right um and i know you mentioned it uh and one of my buddies in the chat definitely wants to hear about them you you mentioned a uh, Kribo. you have yep. what a, a black tail or a yellow tail uh unicolor so okay. gotcha gotcha yep subspecies of black tail so um, because so blacktail is uh dry mark and melanurus, and then the unicolor is melanurus unicolor. So they naturally are in both or in the blacktail population, you can find all varying degrees of black and unicolor in the same habitat ranges. So, right, basically just a blacktail. Long story short, okay, gotcha, yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah, he is a 2018 from uh, Black Pearl. I think that's okay. John Michael, I think yes. is his name. Yep. Yes, yes. Yep, you got it. Um, All right, awesome. Anything I missed on the colubrid side of things before we talk about the rest of your collection? Um, I've got a few little weird odds and ends in there. Um. I have the African file snake. I do have, if you've ever heard of a Rufus beak snake. Yeah. So, yep. Yep. I have, I have a Rufus beak and then, um, sorry, I'm just thinking I'm mentally going over all the rooms right now. I think that's about it. Um, I did leave out that I have hog nose and I have Baird's rat oh, snakes, okay. but, um, cool. Other than that, I think that that covers about everything on the Colubrid end actually. Yeah. 
Gotcha. We had a question in the chat, and I'm actually curious. I've seen brown tails on Morph Market. Is that an integrate of a unicolor and a black tail? So I've never heard the term black or brown tail described or used Neither to describe I. one. I, I would assume that probably because... I'm going to try to find from, it. Yeah, so like from what I've seen, there's like obviously there's black tails, but I know that the black can also come in differing shades and like intensities, just like a lot of other things. There's some variation. So right. I'm sure that it's probably just a black tail crossed to a unicolor, which they're still in that same species, Drymarkin melanurus family. Um, either that or it's just a black tail with a faded out tail would be my guess. But I'm not an expert on Drymarkin, so. If you can DM me the link of the Morph Market ad, I'm trying to find it. Uh, but I'd be happy to bring it up because that is that is interesting. Hold on. Yeah. I was going to say, I know there's a lot of those people who will like, especially I've seen a lot of Unicolor Kribos coming in lately as like imports and people like labeling them very strange things. Right. So. I'm seeing all yellows and blacks. Yeah, unicolors. There, having... unless it's unless it's under some different. Like I just filtered it to Kribo, Kribo and Indigo snakes. I there's a ton of imports, but uh, unicolors do not come in or pop up all that frequently. There's not a lot of people that work with them. So. Okay. That is one that I'm like, I've debated getting a mate for mine just because I'm like, no one really does unicolor, but also right. there's not as much demand for unicolor either. So, yeah. Yeah. And I know, um, oh shoot. Who was it? Was it Jason Hood's episode where basically like, uh, we talked about them a, a bit, you know, like okay. kind of the difference, like they're all the same thing like the Kribos and indigos just different mm -hmm. localities really yeah really they really are like animal. yeah it's like when you look at the like getula complex of king's things like they're all just different colors of the same animal basically yeah cool um let's talk before we get to like the rest of your collection i definitely want to talk about the couple venomous animals you have because i think that's the closest related thing to colubrids uh your name is <laughs> copperhead reptilia and i if i'm not mistaken you do have at least one copperhead in the collection yeah so the name came around kind of for a while i decided i was i didn't want to publicly post the venomous stuff um yeah. it kind of was a why. tongue in yeah and i was kind it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek joke because i'm a redhead so like okay. that was kind of where that was kind of where it came from and like it was kind of one of those like if you know you know type things but i reached a point and it was around when i got because i only have the two venomous so i have um a northern copperhead and then i have the um technical term is sunda island white-lipped pit viper but it's the trimeresserus insularis for anyone who likes latin um and i have the komodo island variant which is the blue morph with the red eyes um, because there's a we're few gonna, different. We're gonna pull it up. I was gonna say I know there's a fairly recent. Who doesn't want to see? Who doesn't want to see that? Come on, guys. Yeah, that's my girl. Um, so that was like a long time dream snake. When I actually worked at the um, back at an animal shelter, we actually had um, rattlesnake dens on the property. Okay. Um, so we had instances of rattlesnakes showing up in. Uh, dog kennels so i would have i had to remove them a few times and i did a lot of work with rear fang i had a friend who passed away but he kept venomous okay. so i kind of got some work um there and i reached a point where i was double hooking you know larger aggressive pythons and oh there's the female twin spot yeah um but so i reached a point where you know, I had had the copperhead for a couple years and um, cause I actually had him for two years before I ever posted anything about him. Um, okay. And again, it was kind of a like, if you know, you know, but I 
don't really talk about him. I don't post him on like my personal social media. Um, and the Insularis was always like a dream animal. Um, yeah. the zoo local to me in Ohio has one. And, um, I would just go there and drool at it. And I always said, if I could find a true captive bred established animal, I would pick it up if it wasn't breaking the bank. And she popped up last right at the very tail end of 2023 as a yearling that had been captive bred, you know, and had been reared up for a while. And after I got her, I kind of decided, you know, as long as I'm doing this safely and responsibly. And that's why if you go to any of my venomous posts, you see the disclaimer at the bottom, like these are not good pets. You know, if I'm taking pictures, it's always, I'm like a foot to two feet away minimum from her or from him. I'm usually beyond like on the other side of a piece of glass or a barrier to where they can't, they could never actually reach me because there's just a lot of stupid people doing venomous shit out there to yeah, be frank about 100%. it. You know? Yeah. And I, I don't want to encourage anyone to ever own or keep a venomous snake because, you know, you, there's a lot that goes into it. Like it's even compared to a water cobra. I, if I'm having a bad day and my brain isn't in my head, I can still go and deal with my water cobra. If I'm having a bad day and I'm not mentally with it, I'm not opening up either of those cages, you know? And then there's going into making sure it's legal in the city, the county, the state, um, I have bite protocols here so that if anything were to happen, I literally have a printed off little folder with paperwork that I just take to the hospital and I say, this is what happened. Here's how you treat it. And I hand them the protocol and it goes over treatment processes. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it, it's one of those, I, when I first started keeping reptiles, I never thought I would keep venomous, but after I had done a little bit of work with them. I decided like it, you can treat it just like a fish, you know, you don't have to touch it to right. enjoy it. You can set up an enclosure. You can do it from a distance. You can get shift boxes. It's something that as much as people think it's dangerous and it is you, in my opinion, you only make it as dangerous as the decisions you make. Yeah. You know, for sure. You really just have to be smart about it. So. Yeah. Hundred percent. Um, Sean in the chat, send me that picture of. I hope this is showing the right way. Uh, can you can you see the picture that's up? I have to open YouTube. Let me know if you guys can see that image. Hold on. Okay. Let me make sure I can see it. Oh, is it not streaming? Yeah, I'm not seeing anything right now. That's fantastic. Okay. <laughs> Browser can't access my screen. Okay. Hold on, guys. I am sorry. Did we get it? I think we got it. Mm. I have no clue. Inch like what that is. If I had to give my two cents on it, that looks like a cross of a unicolor and a black tail, or it's a black tail with a very muted tail color. If I okay. had to give a two cents on it, because the tail is, it's a darker, more like charcoal color. So it's definitely got some pigment. So it could be a cross or it could just be a very poor quality black tail. Interesting. And it's sold. Someone took it. I so. mean, 600 is is ballpark for uh, Unicolor. Um, Blacktails right. go a little bit more. They're more of the, I think they're in the more like eight to 900 range. But I mean, it's it's ballpark. Okay. Gotcha. Cool. Um, and yeah, just going back to the Venomous stuff. Yeah, I do think uh, it's cool of you to kind of put your disclosure that you put at the bottom of all your posts um because it's it's important and it's something i tend to talk about you know i mm -hmm. i disagree with the whole sensationalism with venomous stuff i don't think it's good for the hobby um i have heard other people's opinions where you're like you know uh just like let them do whatever the hell they want 
But in the mm. end, that's, you know, I don't want my friends and family thinking that's what I'm slinging around. Cause I, every single person that asks, Oh, you keep anything, keep anything. It's either poisonous or venomous. And I'm like, no, that's illegal. I can't keep it. I'm not going to keep it. Cause I don't want to die. Mm. Um, I'm like, I'm a responsible person. So yeah, I don't know. Yes. Cause so, so you see all this stuff on social media and how it's portrayed as if it's, you know, such an easy thing to keep. I wouldn't even think about touching it, but I could definitely see on the side of like something like the Insularis. Um, like I could see myself doing that and being very safe from a distance and having a nice little display yep. cage and it just being like that. Cause they're, they're relatively like calm too, right? Like they're not, they're not one of those snakes that's going to come flying out at you from what I've seen. They kind of just sit perched, right? Out of out of the two of mine, my Insolaris is the one that keeps me on my toes. Really? Um, the okay. Copperhead, yep. Considering both were captive bred, the Copperhead is very much the like he wants to move and he doesn't ride a hook super well. But if you double hook him, he'll just sit there and let you do whatever you want. Okay. She now because she is young, she's only a, a little over a year old. Um, she very much wants to like inchworm up the hook and she doesn't want to sit still. Um, if you move fast, even from like two feet away, she's striking at the air. Um, so she's, she's very defensive, but also I've already started just, if I have to clean her enclosure, it's just double hook her, put her in, you know, a lock top bucket, lock it down and call her good. And, you know, she's only nine to 10 inches long right now. So, right. I mean, she's not, She's not an issue. I had actually, I actually had a preference for a male. Um, and by the time I reached out to the person who had her and her two siblings, the other female and the male had already sold. So, gotcha. but it was kind of too good of a situation. I was like, well, there's a size difference, but I, it's too good of a situation. This is what I would want, even though the gender isn't what I would prefer. I can still work with it. Right. You know, cause and, uh, they only get about three, three and a half feet. So, okay. Gotcha. And what is the legality standpoint of venomous where you're at? Is it just free reign or like, did do you had, did you have to get some sort of permit or. So I wish it was not free reign because I do know some very careless venomous keepers up in okay. Michigan. Um, so it is not illegal on a state level. Everything in Michigan comes down to County and city. Gotcha. So again, I live kind of rural. No one really cares where I live, knock on wood, as of like okay. right now. Um, yeah. So there's no laws. I keep everything like the two venomous. If anyone like outside my home ever walked in, they would not see them because they are in rooms behind closed doors. And like if you go into those rooms, they are locked, they are securely labeled. There is a species plaque from a uh, cloud forest on them with like, all their gotcha. info that says like danger venomous snake and like what they okay. are. Okay. So, you know, I, I do take it seriously, but I know people in this area who had like an exoterra in their living room unlocked with a gaboon viper in it, which is just the stupidest thing on the planet. And like the same yeah. dude was keeping like cobras in like latch top 20 gallons. Like, yikes. So, yeah. So, I mean, there's, luckily where I am at there, there's no restrictions, but I did go through and double check that it was legal state, County city okay. um, before I did pursue any of that. And same thing with my larger constrictors, the rear fangs. Um, okay. I made sure all of that was legal before I owned any of them. Gotcha. Okay, cool. And now that kind of transitions us to the large constrictors and everything else that you have in the collection. Cause you still have mm -hmm. a, pretty decent amount i know there's multiple python species there's boas there's um yeah go talk about everything else it's the all other reptiles freestyle as i like to call it all right so um do can i do non-snakes first kind of clear that yeah, out of the way for it. go for it cool so i have four species of tortoise so i have sulcata uh burmese brown mountain uh, Redfoot and Russian. Um, wow. I have Northern and Halmahera blue tongue skinks. I have uh, monkey tailed skinks, which are a future breeding project, hopefully. Nice. Um, 
I have a Russian legless lizard. Um, I have lychee, chihua, gargoyle, and crested gecko. I have leopard gecko and African fat tail, uh, bearded dragons, savanna monitor, a toke, and um, a bee bronze thick toed gecko that kind of lives here on charity. But um, okay. I never see her. I throw bugs in there and there's poop on the ground. So I know she's alive. I've had her for years, but she just exists. Um, and then as far as the other snakes, I have, um, like I said, a lot of um, pythons, a lot of locality boas. So yeah. I have, um, with boas, I have Kenyan, Saharan, and rough-scaled sand boas. I have rosy boas, or I have a rosy boa, rubber boa, rainbow boa, um, dumeril, two of the Solomon Island ground boas, so the Candoya palsoni. Um, and then as far as like true like boa boas, I have uh, four of the Tarahumara mountain boas, which are a locale of Mexican boa. I okay. have two Peruvian long tails, one of which is from Chris uh, from BNS, if he's still in okay. the chat, shout nice, out there. Nice. Um, yep, my mail's from him. Um, I have a hog island, um, Nicaraguan boa, Colombian boa is behind me. That's the big one that you always see. And then I think that's all on the boa end. Okay. Think real quick. Yep. That's all for boas. And then on the um, Python end, I have a very large group of ball pythons, way more than I would really probably like to have, but I have a soft spot okay. for them. So yeah, um, I have about 25 of them. Um, so that's oh, kind okay. of like, I actually keep a lot of them. They're my like dirtiest secret. Like I, they were my first snake and I am, <laughs> I know you they're kind of that few like, of them. I didn't think you had like 25. I thought you had anywhere from like maybe five to 10. I, yeah, no, I, I wish I only had like five to 10, but part of it was like, I wanted to breed them for a bit. And then I yeah. realized how many of them there are. But then when I, it, when I tried to sell them, like I literally sold my GHI female and like six months later contacted the guy because he's local to me and I know him. And I was like, can, can I buy her back? I kind of regret selling her. Okay. So I just have this group of like pythons that I'm never going to sell most of them. Okay. And they just eat rats, but also I'm too stupid to actually sell them. Um, so I have those. Um, I have an Angolan python, so basically the bumpy ball python. Um, yeah. That one, I'm I would want to get a female for him and breed him at some point, but the female prices are just stupid right now, so I'm not gonna do it. Angolans are very low key animals. Like I just I don't know why there aren't more being captive bred. Uh, my buddy Emilio Villarino reptiles, he got he got two females at Daytona, and he's mm -hmm. gonna buy a male later so he'll have a 1.2 i think it was two females uh he can correct me if i'm wrong later but um yeah he bought two at daytona and he's very very happy with them like that was a species yeah. he wanted to get into so uh yeah that yeah. would be cool to see him produce those hopefully in the future but i i definitely think they are on the road to more popularity I think so too. I I really like mine. I wish I could say mine is low key. Like he's kind of psychotic, honestly. Um, <laughs> Some people say that. Do you mind if I just do one thing real quick? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, sorry. I'm back. Um, no, you're good. I have cats, and I just heard a concerning noise. Um, okay. <laughs> so, no problem. But um, but yeah. So I have the Angolan, and like. I wish I could say mine is friendly. He is a terrible animal. And when you pick him up, he sprays pee at you, but he is so pretty. Okay. <laughs> like I, I thoroughly do enjoy him. He's just got the worst attitude, but it makes him a little bit more endearing. So um, I have him. Um, and that's as far as I have on the African pythons are the Angolan and the ball. If, if you ever see me owning like a rock Python, you know, I've lost it because okay. I do really <laughs> like them. I'm just not that stupid. Um, yeah. I'm stupid in other ways, but, um, so then if you go over a little bit, uh, East towards like the Malaysian pythons, I have, uh, Sumatran short tail. Okay. I, uh, 
recently got back into scrubs and I got a little, I think a Maruki. It didn't come okay. with locality info, but I got a, um, not a great place, kind of local to me, got in a clutch of like fresh red neonates and they were not expensive and I bought one and it's doing phenomenally. So I am okay. very happy with that. So I have the scrub, um, I have Maclot, which is another species I'd like to breed one day. Um, I do have the Papuan Python, so the Apodora. Okay. Um, I do have a Retic, a Mainland Cross, and then I have a Super Dwarf that um, will be arriving in the near future, like a okay. full-on, like very small Super Dwarf. So I'm excited for that one. And then um, the majority of the Pythons I really want to work with are more of like the Australian. So I do have a Spotted and a Children's. Nice. Um, and I, I actually had mates for both of them that I picked up at Tinley in October and neither one of them was super well established when I got them. And once I got them, they just never ate for me. So I still want to re get mates for those and, uh, raise those up. Um, otherwise I have a lot of coastal carpets and never thought I would have this many coastals. I have four or five of them. Um, then and I have popwing the carpets. They get big, right? Uh, six to seven foot. Yeah. Okay. They're the ones that because with the carpet pythons, there's there was some taxonomical kind of like bumping around in the last year where right. they thought jungle and coastal were different. Now they're the same, but there's a different type of coastal that is its own species, and those get really big. But okay. we don't really have a lot of those in America, so ours tend to be about five to six foot. Gotcha. Um, so I have uh. Darwin, Papuan, coastal, and jungle carpets. I have a bread lie who is actually in the that enclosure right here. Nice. Um, then the one right behind my head is a sub, eh, not sub adult, but like a juvenile woma. Um, okay. Another one I would like to pair up, but their eggs are a pain in the butt, so I probably won't do it. Um, I think that's about it on the Python end. Okay. Damn, dude, you have. A lot, a lot of species. Uh, how many, how many animals total are, are we talking that you have? Do you even have a count? I want to say last I counted, it was about 158. Okay. Damn. Where I mean, does... it's one of those like. <laughs> no, I was going to say like, how, how do you delegate your time for all of that? I mean, just even as like a casual person and between so many species, that's the thing is like it makes sense when you're regimented with like multiples of the same species, mm -hmm. but because your collection is so all over the place, I'm curious how you're able to delegate that. Um, Google docs is my best friend. Okay. I have a number one. I have like a massive spreadsheet that I'm constantly updating with like number one, I have one. And this is something I think everyone with a large collection should do. Even if your animals don't have names, just write down like, this is their name. This is, you know, species, common name, Latin name, um, genetics, who you got it from, birth date, number one. That helps you keep stuff straight. But I have a feeding chart that I go through. And every time I need to feed someone, I just go to their slot on the chart and I just mark it a color. And if I drop feed them and I need to check them, I just change the color. And so I know if I see purple, I go back the next day and I check them. If it's green, they need to be fed. If it's blue, they need live food. Nice. Um, so I have this whole system but the i kind of keep a little bit weirdly um like for example i keep my house ambient heated about 74 degrees because i like it warm anyway okay. but so like my asian rat snakes and my kribo i don't have to heat them because the enclosures around them yeah. either a give them like like the Kribo is on top of the water cobra. So like I have a radiant heater that the heat just goes up to the Kribo and he doesn't need heat. He's always been fine. Asian rats, I don't have to heat them. Um, a lot of my like North American stuff actually is in my like snake room off of heat, but because I have pythons and the boas in there and I am very much a fan of like overhead halogens whenever possible, there's enough ambient heat in the room that the room will get up to about 81 to 82 degrees during the day. I was going to say even mid seventies, like your North American stuff, I'm sure is relatively good. Right. But yeah, yep. even, even <laughs> less mid seventies, low eighties, like you're absolutely chilling on that. 
Yeah, the only time that I have to move them out of the room is if I want to. Um, so like over winter, I will generally just turn off a couple of the halogens and the room temp will usually go down to mid 60s at night, most of the winter. OK, so like and like there's a few of the enclosures that I'll like keep the heat on for them. And so it keeps certain ones from going too cold. But it's kind of a I tweak individual enclosures different times of the years. I'm I'm very liberal with. Uh, are you familiar with Govies at all? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I have. Them. I'm. Yep. I have them in multiple in every room that has a reptile has a Govie. Okay. Okay. If not in the enclosure like i yes. try to like if there's an animal in a room that is super picky i put the govi right next to them so i can monitor everything right. so like the issue i have had is like a few species i've gotten over the years just the ambient in my house outside of any of the animal rooms just is too much for them so like i even have animals like i kind of didn't want any reptiles in my bedroom but like that is the coldest room of my house. So my bull snake lives in there because he just, he could not live in my snake room. It gets too warm for him. He'd be miserable. Okay. So like he is totally ambient temp in that back room. And I mean, he's active year round still. So, right. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the big thing. But I mean, I would say on an average night, it's two to four hours minimum every night, because even if it's just, you know, I have dedicated days where this is the day I do gecko feedings but i still pop okay. through the rooms and i i missed i you know i check you know i do salads for the tortoises and the skinks and right you know i'm feeding the monitor i'm gut loading the bugs and so it's one of those even if i don't have a ton to do in every room every day because i have four different animal rooms in my house yeah. um it it's kind of a i pop into each room and kind of do a round and check and make sure waters are good no one's pooped in their dish if someone's shed i pull the shed um i have a handful of baby racks or like quarantine racks i make sure those usually minimum every other day i'm pulling everything out checking them cleaning them fresh water that type type of thing yeah so i mean it's it's an a constant thing but it's one of those if i didn't have something to do i'd go crazy and I also work in the animal field right now. So yeah. I'm, I'm the last, I want to say eight to nine years I've worked in the animal field, whether it was in animal sheltering, I actually work in biomedical animal husbandry. Oh, okay. So I'm, so I'm used to taking care of very, very large amounts of animals and sometimes ones with different care requirements all at the same time. So it, I just kind of brought that home with me. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how well it would transfer if I had to move from my house now to like a different home, but also. Yeah. Uh, Chris from BNS was asking, what is the total number of different species you keep and then breed question mark? Um, we kind of, far... he kind of named them all. You could go watch the replay and just count every name he said <laughs> over the last the hour thing... and a half. The thing is, I actually didn't name all of them because there are a few that I forgot. So, okay. um, I, well, it's, but, I'm sure you did. Yeah, I want to say it's it's roughly been about 60 to 65 species that I keep in total. As far as breeding, I actually have not done a ton of breeding, but I have a lot of animals in pairs that are like going to breed. So I would say um, the things that I have bred or plan to breed are uh, I'm still going to throw a ball python together now and again. People can shoot me yeah. for it, but I like ball Nothing pythons. Wrong. And if I do Nothing wrong with it, if I do one clutch a year, I'm not a problem. Sorry. Yeah. That's just my look on it. But so um, it'll be ball pythons, um, mm -hmm. Mandarin rats, twin spot rats, um, Slowinskis. I did put, I do have a trio of Slowinskis cohabbing right now. So I'm hoping I get something from them this year. Um, okay. Tarahumara boas, long tail boas. Um, sorry, I'm going through everything in my head. Did I say the monkey tail skinks and the Russian tortoises? Yeah, you mentioned them earlier. Okay. Okay, yeah. So it'll be, yeah, the main breeding is like Russian torts, monkey tails, gargoyle geckos, long tail boas, Tarahumara boas, mandarin rats, twin spot rats, slow and ski eye, corn snakes, ball pythons. Um, there's a lot of things I have on a list to pair up, 
but I just don't have the mic yet. Mic. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, like a lot of the stuff that I want to pair up is only a year or two old, so I'm not in a mad dash for it, but it's right. also stuff that I'm like, you know, the the area that I live in, there's not a lot of appreciation for obscure species. The expos around here are a lot of like ball python, crested gecko, retic, boa, leopard gecko, beardy. That's it. And like, if it's you anything else, a lot of people Florida. don't pay attention. <laughs> you should come Better see or worse. Florida Repticon. Um, yeah. Let's just say it's not very diverse. My tables yeah, with like, Texas rat snakes are considered diverse. Texas rats and ball it, pythons. And that's the thing. Like, I, I kind of want to be that table where I, because I like the weird species, I kind of want to do a little bit of everything where if I do, you know, three species this year and four next year, I could do different species and give females a year off, but still have different stuff. So every time you, you see my table or you go to my site, it'll be something different. So I brought, there was one show I brought my big female cocci and I had multiple people come up and tell me, I literally used it just as an attention grabber. Cause I was like, let's mm -hmm. see how many people I could get to just stop at my table to look at this animal. And the amount of people that stopped and said, Oh my God, that looks fake. And, or mm -hmm. that's the best snake I've seen at the show. That's very telling. Um, yeah. That they're just not seeing these animals all the time. Mm -hmm. And, and, it give it alludes a little bit to the potential popularity they can have. Um, and speaking of the cock side, that's that's a species uh, I will likely be breeding soon, and there might be some animals coming that I'll be able to pl plug and play with right away. So I'm quite excited for that, and you guys will know about it once I get them. But uh, yeah, that should be fun. So anyway, that that was very telling, and I just. <laughs> I can't wait to be that guy to have them on the table. Cause I think I'm going to be the only guy in Florida to do it. Yeah. And you know, I've um, Chris from BNS can confirm this. I was talking to him and a couple other people about trying to get um, black pine snakes because there's no one in Michigan with them, but it's the whole, you know, they're, you know, ESA listed. You have to have the permit to cross state lines right. with them. And then that's the whole, if I want to produce them, I either A, have to sell them all within my state or I have to help people get paperwork and yeah. I want to do it. It's just the whole, like, it's, it's a lot of money. They're big snakes. And I truly don't know how great the market in Michigan would be. And I could flood it so easily. So yeah. it's kind of one of those, like, I want to do it, but I just, I remember being a kid and going to reptile expos when I was like, I think I went to my first one. I was like eight or nine, you know, and I remember, you know, leopard geckos and blue tongue skinks and carpet pythons and boas. And, you know, the, the bread and butter species were still there, but, you know, as a young kid growing up in, you know, the early two thousands, um, you know, I had a, I've had a subscription to reptiles magazine since I think 2007, you know, I have all my back issues and you go through and it's all the, you know, the crazy iguana morphs and all the North American colubrids and you, you just don't see it anymore. And like some of the, you know, I like some of the best animals I have as far as like weird colubrids and weird stuff goes are like from these older keepers who are, you know, kind of getting out of keeping because they just, they don't see the interest in their species anymore. But at the same time, like, even if I only have a yeah. pair and I put out five babies every couple of years, I'm still keeping them around for someone else. You know, that's kind wow. of how I look at it as just if I can do that to kind of provide something other than a ball python or a corn snake or a crested gecko to someone, it makes me that much happier, you know, just putting diversity into the hobby. Yeah. Uh, just like even, um, you know, seeing some like some other, uh, more obscure species like you're mentioning, like uh, Vilanti with the Porphyrisia. Mm -hmm. So I have a pair from Matt Most, but I know mm -hmm. that's something he's like, he has a 1.4 posted up on Morph Market. Like it's something like he's moving away from some species. But I honestly feel lucky that I'm going to be able to kind of like keep that going. Like that's a species yeah. that 
you know, Matt's breeding and like who the hell else is breeding with the locality information that he has um, and stuff. So it, it's just like, cool. I now get to be that guy that's carrying on that, that legacy potentially if he's fully out of it. I don't know if he's fully out of them, but yeah, so mm -hmm. it, it's cool. But like, that's, that's what needs to happen. It's like the next generation of keepers needs to kind of step in and continue the propagation of these species to kind of keep them in captivity you know yeah a hundred percent i mean that's where that's why i for a long time i i actually wanted my focus to be rubber boas and calabar pythons um right. i actually if you've ever seen calabar pythons it looks like a rubber boa but armor plated and i brought in nine of them a year or two ago as imports wanting to establish some captive breads and they just all slowly even the ones that fed, I would just open up their bins and they'd be dead one day. So really? like, yeah, they, the import process on that species is just so awful. And so they all come in bruised and battered and beat up. And it just, none of them, re I had one that made it more than a year and a half and all the rest of them just kind of ticked away. But, you know, and then I wanted to do more with rubber bows, but uh, Connor Wardle, who is an excellent keeper has some really funky stuff if you're into like weird desert colubrids and stuff um he's doing a lot of work with like assembling the different bloodlines of rubber boas available right now and okay. so i was like okay i don't need that but when i got my first slowinski just as a as a pet i was like this is like a, a corn snake with a better temperament which is hard to believe and i was like but they're brown and then the more i found out about them i was like there's really only about four or five people really breeding them yeah. but all of the stock around is descended from like less than 10 animals so like the, the yeah. inbreeding just insane and i'm like that's something that even if it's a brown little dirt snake that no one cares about i can be the person where i really feel like herpetoculture needs to make that shift where even if you like ball pythons have like one other species that not everyone has that is not as well represented and just breed them to the best of your ability to keep diversity so that there is someone in the hobby putting more out there. For and sure. like, if that's kind of where I am with the Slowinskis, like they're never going to make me rich. They're at most a hundred dollar snake, but there's no one really attempting to cross the bloodlines and, you know, get new blood out there and anything like that. Yeah. There's probably three people or like two people plus myself that I know that are as jacked up about Texas rat snakes. <laughs> like people like don't really like I like I walk in and I see Texas rats and I'm like, yeah, let's go. Like, let's breed these things. Like, I can't wait to see babies. And then most of the reptile hobby could give a shit less about them, but I really don't care. I'm my goal is to try to make them more popular, but but no, I can you breed them for a better temperament? <laughs> Mine are great. I, I, mine are evil. I, I swear to God, I go in, so I think I do a good job at, at training them. My yeah. babies, especially, I very literally I go over with my whole hand open so that even if mm. they try to bite, they're biting straight palm. So like they're they're not getting anything. They can't grab your palm. You go yeah. over and you kind of just put your hand over their head and grab them and like kind of just cup them like a like a claw and you pick yeah. them up and they're usually good from there. I do. I don't get bit after that. All See, of my mine are, from last year, and that's that's uh, the absolute truth. See, mine are I the got, ones where I like got bit up by a by a sub adult. I don't think you can see it, but I got chewed yeah. on yesterday though. First time. See, mine while. are the ones where like you pick them up and they'll be in your hand and they will just nail your arm. They're swinging for your head, and I'm like, I the leucistic one is. I always wanted a leucistic Texas rat and I knew they were going to be awful. But the other one kind of was like a friend did a wholesale thing and got offered like a free, like imperfect Texas rat. And I have no idea what's wrong with her. She's just a little weird looking. Like there's okay. something that I'm like, I, I think your head is slightly off shape, but like you're fine and you're two years old and you eat, but she is just the most spiteful thing. And I'm like, if I hadn't put two years into raising you at this point, I'm like, you would be so gone. 
<laughs> like she is just yeah. mean. Yeah. Like, I I give you so much credit for doing Texas as your your rat snake because they are dude. I all the ones I've I met are just evil. And that and that's my goal is to prove that they're not that bad. And they're not. And Kevin Kevin Sheehan would say the same thing. And so would the uh, the third person I'm talking about is a guy named Zach Zanone. I think that's how you pronounce okay. it. Um, those two people would absolutely agree with me that they're fantastic animals. <clears throat> and I know they're <laughs> just as excited about them as I am in terms of what there is to do with genetics and stuff. But yeah. Um, all right, cool. That was a long tangent. I did want to get into <laughs> uh, kind of some of the other stuff like off animal topic uh, or just straight yeah, totally. snake talk. Um, kind of what the what the title of tonight's podcast was about. Uh, let's go into it, I I put it in quotes. The oh shoot, what did I? Uh, common sense husbandry. That's what you have in your bio on Instagram. I want to hear from you. What exactly? Like, and I've seen your setups. Like, I see how you keep your animals and. Very literally, by definition, it does seem like common sense husbandry, but I'm curious to hear from your perspective exactly what you mean by that. So I think if you're on any like Instagram, TikTok, Facebook groups, I think a lot of people have seen like there's this big push now that like people are labeling, them, labeling themselves like I'm an ethical keeper. I'm a this keeper i made this and you know this is what i wanted to talk about because i don't know what the hell groups you're in i don't see this oh i left them anywhere. all it's <laughs> but if you go on to like a lot of like i okay so you're in your like early facebook 20s groups? right yeah well i've left basically every reptile facebook group like i used to be okay. in like reptile enrichment and training and um one of the admins berated me for telling someone that a blood python would not make a phenomenal animal to like clicker train and reward train because I tried to explain to them the metabolism of this animal. You can't use food as a motivator for an animal that eats once every four to six weeks. It's just not realistic. They were like, Oh, I want a python that I can feed regularly and train to do stuff. I was like, get a Mac lot or like a small carpet or something like something with a faster metabolism. And I was just told that that was, incorrect and it was rude to shoot down someone's aspirations because any animal is trainable and i'm like yeah but you know you're you're not looking at the bigger picture how and do train, how do you train up i like no there's and like the thing is like okay i was brought like my big entrance to the reptile hobby was like 2007 through like 2012 right like and i think about how we did things back then like 40 gallon breeder was like the minimum for a ball python right and now all these groups are pushing for like six by three as the minimum for a ball python they're saying like six by three is the minimum for a bearded dragon or a skink or you know three foot by like 24 by 24 by 36 is the minimum for a crested gecko six foot by three foot by three foot is the minimum for a black rat eight foot by four foot is the minimum enclosure for a carpet python now and like you reach a point where like there are people in the hobby who write these <laughs> care guides right and they claim to be like scientifically based <laughs> they are a cult yes and that's something that i've really started to just beat the drum for because like i see it in the rescue i work with like okay. people will come to like when we're doing like adoption events we're like hey here's like a juvenile leopard gecko that we're looking to adopt. And people are like, oh, I can't afford a four foot enclosure for a leopard gecko. And we're like, you don't, you don't need a four foot enclosure for a leopard gecko. And they're like, you need, but, a, you need but, a 20 gallon long. Yeah. For it, one, thank you. for one, for one, you need a 20 yeah. gallon long. One adult. Yeah, and the thing gecko. is, and the thing is, I think so many people are so used to like, not using the space of an enclosure properly to where like honestly for me i have no problem keeping a ball python in a 40 gal breeder like i mean there 
I just think 36, 18, 18, like, can you do bigger? Yes. Will I ever fault someone for doing bigger and going beyond? Absolutely not. But there's this whole thing now where a lot of newer keepers into the hobby that have like two animals, two years of experience are saying that there are things being pushed around like the minimum is never enough. You must always exceed the minimum. But the minimum is now a six foot enclosure. So are we at the point where in um, like, yeah, are we at a going. point? Yeah. Are we at a point in the hobby where the minimum is going to be in a few years where if I want to house my boa, I have to give it a whole bedroom now, you yeah. know? Um, I feel like it's do you want almost me to like, yeah, no, I mean, I, if you have an answer, go ahead. But all I was going to say is like, I feel like it's like, they're just trying to live on some super it's a pedestal high. Yeah, a super ethical it's, high horse where they're like, I'm the best. I'm giving my animals the best care. And if you're not doing exactly what I'm doing, you suck mm -hmm. or you're mistreating or abusing these animals. Um, I'm pretty sure all those people would come to my house and crucify me in front of my reptile collection with the racks I have. But mm -hmm. I mean, I think I keep my animals pretty well, but. Yeah. Yeah. So. I'm I mean, like to answer um the question about being curious as to where or who the ideology came from. Um yeah. I don't really want to name drop, and I'm not doing this as an attack, but like Reptifiles is touted as like the premier, most ethical, most scientifically accurate care guide on the market. But the thing is, literally every year for the past two or three years, the enclosure minimums have increased by one foot to multiple feet per species per year like they were saying something like for a red-footed tortoise you need a minimum of like an eight to ten foot enclosure which like i don't fully disagree with for a very large adult but we're talking like juvenile subadults and there's never mention in these care guides about like if you have a hatchling started in something smaller it's always right. you need a four foot viv if you give it enough hides enough clutter the fake plants the bioactive they it's the push that if you're not doing that you're doing it wrong and the thing is like there are people now within the hobby that say if you do not do bioactive if you don't do planted enclosures there have been people literally saying that you are neglecting your animal because the thought that a reptile is inherently wild and then we need to provide absolute replication of nature in a box for them or else it is neglectful to that animal there are people saying that keeping a snake of any species on Aspen is abusive, not to mention other stuff. Like there are people that say if you use radiant heat panels, heat tape, ceramic heat emitters, that that is neglectful to your animals. It's a whole push from younger are you keepers. To pull that, the, are you supposed to pull the sun out of your ass? Like what, what do they want for heat? It's because a few years back, there was a study that like halogen and like deep heat emitters reach further into the animal's body and like deeper into like deeper layers of the skin. So it's a more usable form of heat. But okay. at the same time, like we know other options work. It's the same thing as like the UVB police. They say you have to give everything UVB, but as someone who works in animal research, we have not done studies on any of these species in large enough groups to pull blood chemistry on hundreds of animals that have both been given UV and no UV to actually claim that they truly need it in the majority of species. So right. there's all these guides and people who claim to be experts. And a lot of the time they don't even keep the species that they're talking to people about, or they're, you know, one of the reptifiles guides literally quotes Jay Brewer as being a like knowledgeable resource on retex because he breeds so many. Yeah. And I mean, as someone who has retex, I would not listen to a thing that man tells me. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> not. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's a whole thing where like I've had people come after me for using glass top aquariums, but like when I came into the hobby in the two thousands, I learned how to keep humidity up. I have raised a Brazilian rainbow boa to adulthood in a glass top enclosure and that animal is still alive today right, doing like, totally like, fine. The, like the fish glass tops like the fish tank mm -hmm. yeah oh, um yeah. 
And then how did you keep that secure? Would you put like a weight over it or something or what were you? Um, like the Zilla, Zilla does like a slide top 40 gal breeder that like oh. it slides in like lap locks on top. I just oh, do that okay, or that I do talk about. Okay. I thought you were talking about, cause I know there were some fish tank models where it was literal. Like it was almost like a glass mm -hmm. like thing. And like, if you oh. drop that on the floor, it would break. Whereas I know what you're talking about oh. though. I know those Zillow, uh, Zilla tanks that you're mentioning. Yeah. But like, if you go onto like care guides nowadays, they say like a Brazilian rainbow boa must be raised in a PVC. But in my experience, I did Cypress, I did cocoa, I did a moss mix, and I misted it twice a day. Snake is totally fine. He's five feet long. I just posted a, or I'm about to post a picture of him on my Instagram because he just shed. Like, there's so much. I don't want to say like choosing camps within the hobby, but there are so yeah. many people that are like. I align with bioactive, anything else is wrong. But then there's people that are like, I do sterile tub setups. There's so little room for the gray area because I think you did agree. How I keep my animals is totally different from how you keep yours, but it works in my scenario. Yep. And there's so little, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There is so little acceptance and I'm seeing it primarily from the newer generation of keepers to the hobby. Like the people that did not have a reptile before three years ago. And now they have a, like a beardy, a crusty and a ball Python and they know everything. Yeah. And it's, it's a huge issue. Like we've done outreach events with my rescue and someone came up with a boa and I was like, Oh, that's a nice annery. And they were like, this is a true red tail. I'm like, okay, you don't even know your boa is a morph. I'm not even going to continue the conversation. And then they proceeded to tell us how we were keeping everything incorrectly. And I'm like, you, you don't even know the animal in your hand that yeah. you own. So like, it's just, you can't, you're damned if you do talk to them and you're damned if you don't, you know? Right. So that's, that's really the horn I, or the drum I want to beat is that there, there's multiple ways to keep an animal humanely and that your enclosure size is not the sole factor in how ethically or correctly you keep the animal. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, yeah, it's just super tough, man. And then like, obviously there's, there's good people like that are just that sit in between. Cause like, mm -hmm. I, 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 well, I don't even think there's like another side. It's just extreme. And there's people who like, are like, Hey, don't be a fucking animal abuser. It's like, those, yeah. those are the two sides. It's like, don't be an animal abuser or your extreme, like need to have, you know, what, like you're talking about, um, and, you know, and then there's a healthy medium, obviously, like I, you know, mm -hmm. I talked about it, like I had Roy Blodgett on, uh, and I went on his podcast and I, like, I told them straight up, like, I was a little nervous to go on their podcast because of like mm -hmm. the standards that they keep their animals at, like they keep a very high standard. And I appreciate yeah. that greatly. Like they're super cool. They keep super cool enclosures and they're like, nah, dude, like you keep your animals, like they're healthy. Like you, you do you like, we're, we don't, mm -hmm. we don't care about that. I'm like, awesome great perfect i'm like that's awesome for me i mean like that's the thing and kind of going into a little bit of my personal world like i again i work in animal biomedical you know yeah. whether or not people agree with that i work on the like making sure animals are treated humanely portion of it okay and we have a group of people in, at my institution who works with um, lemon frost leopard geckos. It's a morph that develops cancerous yeah. tumors. The animals yeah. are used as a cancer study. Um, the ethics committee that oversees everything, basically unanimously, like an animal welfare committee, agreed that a space of less than a 10 gallon tank was okay for a single leopard gecko under certain parameters with certain enrichment, housing, temperature, dietary oh, things being met for sure absolutely and like i would never say it's okay to keep an adult in that size space oh no that's I, just I a me agree. thing yeah but if that's what an actual ethics committee declares as the bare minimum i trust that far more than anyone on the internet because that's yeah. an ethics committee you know what i mean so it's difficult because like I'm of the same mindset. If your animals are clean, if they are healthy, if they are growing properly, if you are able to provide for them, 
that's all I care about. And there are certain things like I, sh I would say, yes, if you have a carpet Python, you should give it the ability to perch. I personally would never keep like a carpet where they couldn't perch. They're, they're designed to do it. But at the same time, I have no problem keeping a sand boa in a six inch tall rack. It's a sand boa. You know what I mean? And people want to just blanket everything as every species has the same requirement when they don't. And it's, it's just so hard to explain that to people, especially with obscure species, because they want to treat it like a corn or a ball python or a king. And well, you have even to explain. A, even a ball python, man. Like, I mean, you take any of these baby snakes, like even a ball python mm -hmm. or a corn snake, you take any of these baby snakes and you put them in a giant, to them, it's a giant 40-gallon breeder. And mm -hmm. you're going to find them under, most likely you are going to find them under the same hide 95% of the time. Mm -hmm. It's just like, the under the heat spot or in the yeah over the heat spot but yeah yeah i mean and for the longest time when i came back into the hobby really heavy i banged the drum of like you need to have three four foot enclosures racks are inhumane like i was i was in that group okay and the thing was i got a ball python and i got her three years old from the breeder she was a hold back he was selling her and she was three feet long. I put her in a 40 breeder thinking it's better than the tub she was in. She didn't eat for the better part of a year straight. And then she finally ate. She's fine. But I eventually put her back into a very large rack. And that is the best that snake has ever fed for me. So like yeah. it's this whole like these this side of the hobby, the advanced side really wants to bang this whole they're intelligent they're incredibly sentient they're they all have unique preferences they all need the same enclosure size and i'm like well if you want to say they're intelligent and they all have their preferences they can also prefer a smaller space and have yeah. like i have ball pythons that want to be in racks i have ball pythons in enclosures and i let the animal tell me what they want and yeah. that's where a lot of this common sense like look at the animal in front of you and address what that animal needs that's my biggest thing yeah no, I've definitely heard of that where a ball python won't eat in uh, an enclosure. And in my opinion, for animals like that, and if you're like desperate, like half, I need to put it in an enclosure for whatever reason. Like, I think mm -hmm. keeping it in as small as it could fit in and with a hide spot, and then that animal will most likely eat and just getting yep. the temperatures right and stuff. Um, those factors, like like Chris is saying, I'm dealing with a customer now that put a ball in a 10 gallon and won't eat. Uh, mm -hmm. Chris, I mean, Chris, you've been doing this a long time, but like I would tell them try to put a hide in the tub and make sure the temps are right. And like, because nine times yep. out of 10, that'll do the job. But yeah. Mm hmm. Like that, that's yeah. always my go to, especially seeing like being able to hatch ball pythons, like hide temperatures right, baby's going to be okay. Yep. Exactly. And it's just, there's so much that because some of the older generation of keepers that have all of the wisdom and all of the, they know the tricks, they know how to do it, but because they might keep in a different method than the pet keepers, the pet keepers don't want to listen to the people that have been there, done that, got the t-shirt. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I mean, I was talking with Eric Westmoreland about it at Tinley. I was like, sometimes you just, you can't, you can't change stupid. I'm sorry to say, like it. I hate to be blunt about oh, it, but been, like he's been going for all the all the memes lately on Facebook. He keeps posting some some funny shit. I mean, it's it's true though. I mean, we're we're at the point where I mean, when I got my first crested gecko, the minimum was a 12, 12, 18, and now it's like a 36, 36, 36, basically. And I'm like, who who's making the decisions? One person reading a field study and saying i think this is right right you know yeah no i get you yeah it sucks you know that's it, the uh it's the this is the world we're dealing with but it's all right um i think one way or another people will just appreciate you if you're keeping your animals healthy and well and you're reproducing stuff that usually indicates health though sometimes not really, but uh, 
Yeah. Usually, usually eating and breeding like indicates good, healthy animals. Um, and I think mm -hmm. for the average keeper and like breeder like ourselves, um, as long as our animals are performing like that, they're pretty solid. So, yep. Yeah. Yep. I, I can agree with that a hundred percent. Yeah. Awesome. So kind of like looking towards wrapping up, um, mm -hmm. You know, we went over everything that you're currently keeping, but what do you think the future kind of looks like for you with Copperhead Reptilia? I know you mentioned like a little bit more breeding, adding some more pairs yeah. to the species you're currently keeping. But uh, what do you what would you say is on the horizon for you for, let's say, the next like three to five years or so? Next three to five years, the goal is if if i can afford to make it happen i'd like to build on the monkey tail skink project a little bit more um i really want to get a few more uh types of boa i actually have kind of decided if there's i i really love my carpet pythons um and i'm still gonna try and breed them and work with them and get a few more of them but i really want to work more with um locality boas i really want to get some uh, another hog island i want to get Argentines and the Pearl Islands, so the Sabogai, um, okay. which are some of the like smaller species minus the Argentine, um, and just work with those. Working with Maclots, I've I've thrown around the idea of if any of the people that I've kind of been watching have an available male Apodora, I've debated getting a male for my female, but also I'm on the fence because they like to eat each other. Yeah. Um, and my female will know, eat anything um, that moves. Yeah, I know. Uh, he's not Ryan he's Young. In here. No, I was gonna say Riley's oh. reptiles, Riley Jimison. I know he's mm -hmm. trying to breed Apodora right now, I believe. I think he has a pair, so um, yep, but yeah, yep, he's had a pair together for a while, and then um, I know Ryan Young just got a clutch, uh, two days ago, three days ago, yeah, something you know like what? That. I saw that, I saw that post, yep. Yep. And then other than that, um, only thing I'm really looking at, and it's something I might do later this year. Um, I'm in talks with a gentleman over in the UK to bring in some European rat snakes that are not currently in the US hobby. Okay. Um, Which are so he you? had, so it's a, actually a new species that I had not heard of. Um, they're called uh, Eurasian rat snakes. They used to be treated as four lined rat snakes but they are um i think they're from armenia is what he said his are from but so they were discovered or found to be a separate species in 2019 and he has a couple of pairs um they basically if you've ever seen like an escalapian rat snake they look very similar but a little okay. bit of dark marks on the head yellow belly um kind of like a black and green army camo modeling down their back um he has a couple pairing this year if they don't breed this year he's going to put them together next year but i am in talks with him about importing a couple of those along with a few other species that aren't super common in u.s herpetoculture and i would really wow. like to if i can make that happen i'm gonna try um but that's a big like if he even gets them to produce this year or next year so gotcha. okay cool yeah. awesome um now circling back to kind of colubrids in general mm -hmm. this is the question i kind of like to leave everyone on what would you say so you know um talking to someone who maybe it's their first reptile maybe mm -hmm. they've kept other species but they're looking to get into colubrids what's kind of your elevator pitch your kind of message to them uh to kind of take that leap you know whatever species it is but like what 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 would you have to say to them about like why colubrids over you know something else as much as i love boas and pythons i love the colubrids because they're interactive i mean if you go through my house a lot of my display enclosures are like Japanese rat snake, blood red corn snake, bull snake. I mean, 
the it's because you walk by the enclosure and they're going to come up and see you, especially if they're hungry. So, I mean, yeah, your pythons and your boas are going to do that, but by and large, they're, they're going to sit there and they're going to wait for something to come by. Right. If you really want a snake that is always doing something is keyed into what's going on. Absolutely. Colubrids are the way to go. I mean, plus yeah. let's be real. If a colubrid is established well, you're never going to have to beg it to eat a mouse. The rat is never going to be half a degree too cold for it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You're 100% right. I'll throw straight at my own ball pythons, but you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, if it's a corn snake or a king snake, I, I never have to check if they've eaten the mouse. If they grabbed it, they ate it, you know? Yeah. Some things I do, like I my my Volanti, they're just weird. Some weeks they'll just not eat, and I'm just like... All right. Mm -hmm. And then the next week they will. I'm like, okay. And I got to drop feed them. I'm like, it's just, it's just a shot in the dark if they want to eat that week or not. But I yeah. think they prefer smaller meals. I think that's kind of their thing. Coxi will be very aggressive with feeding, and the Volanti mm -hmm. are very, very lax. I was going to say, my, my Coxi will. If he's hungry, he comes out swinging, but the Mandarins, I have to drop feed and like, close the bin, walk away and check them in a few hours. And it's always gone, but you know, they're, yeah. they're never going to, I've had my one Mandarin in five years and she's, I've seen her eat twice. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So. Damn. Nice. All right, man. Well, it's been a fantastic hour and 50 minutes. There were like 10 plus people in here the entire time, probably between like 15 and 20 throughout the entire show. What do you have to say to everyone nice. who came out and wanted to uh, hear what you had to say tonight? Yeah, I appreciate everyone coming out. Like, sincerely, I know I don't have a huge presence. So anyone tuning in and really wanting to hear my rambles, I appreciate more than anyone knows. Yeah, and I'm sure, you know, I... I, you know, I hate it sometimes, but like the holiday, I'm sure there was more people just like with family or whatever. So it's all good. I know people will watch the replay, so there will be some views on it. Uh, and hopefully people reach out guys. If you're not doing so already, uh, the link to Chris's Instagram is in the description. So go click straight on that. And it's going to take you straight to his Instagram page. Uh, that's again, it's copperhead. What is it? Underscore reptilia or something. Uh, copperhead dot reptilia okay yeah I, I knew it was one or the other okay cool so, yeah so uh go follow him and do all that but thank you man it's been a great episode appreciate you being yep. on i'm gonna thanks throw for having me back. on yeah absolutely i'm gonna throw you backstage run the outro just hang out for a couple minutes and we'll talk after sounds good thank you all right yeah no problem guys what another great episode um you know, always like bringing on a uh, different uh, variety of guests. You know, even though Chris is not per se like a breeder, like a lot of the other guests I've had on, I think he gives a really, really good perspective just because of the massive array of species he keeps um, that aren't just colubrids. Like, I think it's super impressive that he's keeping anywhere between 60 to 65 and having like an efficient system. Um, to you know up, upkeep with all that because i would i would lose my mind trying to do that especially with my job and whatever like i have a system and it works for the species i have but damn so big props to him uh guys as usual as i always mention meteoric serpents t-shirts are available hit me up if you are interested in one all my social medias are down below in addition to that make sure you hit that like button hit that subscribe on today's podcast uh if you're in the replay gang thank you so much for sticking to the end of this episode if you're watching here live thank you so much you're a real one for actually being here uh that's awesome um as i always talk about animals are on morph market i have a few available go support us arc Blake's Exotic Feeders got the best quail. Go DM him if you're interested in some quail. Every other Friday on the Trap Talk Reptile Network, you could go check out Thank God It's Colubrids. That is featuring me and Alvaro from Clover's Reptiles. Last but not least, the Meteoric Serpents Patreon. If you're interested in joining that, supporting me, growing a community, uh, let's build this podcast. Let's get it big. But guys, 
Uh, that is all it for today's episode. Again, this has been the Colubra Corruption Podcast, and this was episode number 20 with Chris from Copperhead Reptilia. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Peace out. Have a great night.